Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, farmers, welcome to another episode of the Thriving Farmer Podcast. So today's interview is with John Moody. Now, the Moody family has been farming and homesteading on 35 acres in the rolling hills of Kentucky, just outside Louisville for the last decade. John is a well-known speaker and author, having written four books to help farmers and homesteaders achieve their dreams, pursue lives with greater freedom, self-sufficiency, sustainability, and success. So today's episode really focuses on John's uh, background and how he got started farming, as well as the new book he has out, which is all about weeds. And so um, he gave me a pre-copy. I was able to glance through it. It's a great, I would say, resource guide. And so for the larger farmer, it's not going to go into depth on, let's say, spider cultivation or tine weeders or anything like that. But what it is good is for, let's say, the smaller scale farmer and backyard homesteader who's looking to figure out uh, you know, just what are all the different options out there? You know, solarization, occultation, um, different mulches. What are the dangers of using different mulches? How to use different um, techniques, you know, like steaming or flame weeding. All that kind of stuff is in this book. So I'd say it's a great resource guide. I'm definitely going to have a copy on my shelf. And uh, just again, if I have a question about, you know, what I'm thinking about, just check it out as the great starter guide, because John has done very extensive research on this book, communicate with people all over the U.S. And he even reached out to me a couple times while he was writing it, just kind of, you know, asking about specific aspects of what things we use for cultivation. So again, you're going to enjoy this conversation. We dive into all things weeds. We talk about the mindset of weed control. We talk about different techniques, um, a lot about mulches and, you know, the problems with using organic mulches, how they can be contaminated with uh, herbicides. So we go into that as well. So again, have a listen and uh, it's going to be a a great interview. And before we dive into the interview, though, I wanted to call out a few of the reviewers who have left reviews for us over on iTunes. Now, again, all you have to do is go to the Thriving Farmer podcast website. At the bottom, there's a link. You can just leave a podcast um, review and we really appreciate that. It really helps us with the rankings. It helps us um, get this podcast out to more farmers. And again, I really appreciate what you guys have to say about the podcast. So without further ado, I'm going to dive into two recent reviews. So the first one is by SARW19. Um, who says, huge fan. This is an amazing podcast to listen to whether you're a long time farmer or a first timer getting through their second growing season. I listen to each and every podcast and even take notes. Every guest speaker is full of knowledge and excited to share their stories. Well, we really appreciate your review, SARW19. Thanks again for writing that in. You gave us five stars, which again, (laughs) that's awesome. We appreciate that. Um, The second review I wanted to listen here was by SVT Farm um, says raving fan five stars again. I am listening and recommending this podcast in many circles and conversations due to the depth and breadth of important work discussed in the content. Thank you, Michael. Well, again, SVT Farm, we really appreciate uh, you listening. We appreciate you sharing this so we can reach more farmers all around the world. And guys, again, with two to you, we have now over 60,000 downloads of the podcast. Um, We will definitely break 100,000 by the end of the year, which we're super excited about. And it would not be possible without you. Um, First listening, recommending guests, um, sharing this. So again, all those things are very important and we appreciate you doing that. All right, that was a lot. Let's go ahead and dive into this interview with John Moody that talks all about weeds. John, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Great. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Yeah. Can you give us a little bit more of an overview of your farming operation? Yeah. So we're located about an hour outside of Louisville, Kentucky. We own about 35 acres. Probably about 15 acres of that is woodland. Um, About five acres to about eight acres is currently in, you know, intermediate scrubland, you know, kind of pasture um, that because of the way they logged the property we before we bought it, it needs some remediation and love. Um, and then the remaining acres are open pasture land. 
we've done a mixture of things over the year. We've raised grass-fed beef on the farm. We've done egg layers. We do a lot of different vegetable production. We have a high tunnel, um, probably about 25,000 square feet of annual or herb production outside. And then we have a bunch of perennials that we've planted as well. So we're kind of a, a little mixed operation that's tried to figure out, given our land and given our location and given our markets, what really would work best, you know, to be most profitable um, for us. Gotcha. So how did you get started farming? Oh, goodness. So had you met me in college or even when I was doing my master's work, you would have been willing to go to the local bookie and bet every dime and dollar you had that you would never find me doing what I do now. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm just like the last person you would ever expect to be growing vegetables and doing the other stuff I do now. Because when I was a kid, I had like four food groups, chocolate chip cookies, sugary breakfast cereal. I ate a beyond terrible standard American diet growing up. Um, I was so pasty white from playing video games and watching cartoons that 150 watt light bulbs were jealous. Um, <laughs> you know, just like, you know, I grew up in the 80s um, where it really became normal to be sick relatively regularly, to have dental decay, you know, to have bad allergies. That was just like a normal childhood, mm. you know, some 80s, 90s. So I always grew up thinking that was normal. Um, and then in my early 20s, um, I began to get exposed to some different authors and writing and, and thinking about some different stuff. And then I developed duodenal ulcers when I was mm. 23 years old. And so, you know, the only way I can describe it is invite Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs to live in your gastrointestinal tract. Give them razor sharp pickaxes, crack cocaine and Metallica music. Oh boy. And it's just like you're being ripped apart on an all night gnome mining rave constantly. And so because of that, you know, the only thing my doctor could offer was pharmaceuticals. And I'd just gotten to that point of being like able to kind of question the, the whole thing, the whole system, the whole. Um, and so I asked my doctor what these pharmaceuticals did, and he couldn't even really give a good answer. He had to break out the drug insert, told me they shut off my body's ability to produce hydrochloric acid. And I asked him a simple question. I go... But if my body's supposed to produce hydrochloric acid, isn't it going to be like a huge problem long term to shut off something my body was made to do? Uh -huh. And he, he just like, you know, really bright guy and his mouth just kind of dropped. He had never in all of his years of medical training ever had somebody pose that kind of question, you uh -huh. know? So we began a journey from, you know, shopping at, Kroger and Sam's Club and Walmart to shopping at Whole Foods and Wild Oats. And over the course of about two years, we completely changed. You know, like we just went down the entire rabbit hole mm -hmm. of, you know, real food. I was able to heal my ulcers in about six months, which the doctor said was impossible. Mm. And, you know, I grew up with seasonal allergies so bad that Benadryl sent me free stock options as a patronage thank you. <laughs> and I now live on a farm in the Ohio River Valley, one of the top five worst places in the nation for allergies. Absolutely. I don't have any seasonal allergies at all. Wow. I had a dental cavity. I think it's probably been almost 20 some years. Yeah. So, you know, so I saw like, wow, like, Real food, properly raised and properly prepared, promotes health. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this was a long time ago now. We're talking like 15, 16 years. And so there was a lot of things I just couldn't get people in Kentucky to grow. Mm -hmm. um, or I couldn't get them to try, you know, certain growing methodologies. So I just said, heck with it. Me and a friend didn't really want to live in the city anyway. I said, well, I'll just buy a farm and start raising some of this stuff. That's how we got into farming. Okay. So, John, who would you say the book is geared towards, um, the Winning the War on Weeds book? I primarily wrote it for, like, you know, homesteaders and small-scale farmers who are really looking to understand a wide range of different techniques that they can use to reduce their weeding. Uh-huh. 
you know, so like if you're like a five or six acre operation, most likely if you're at five or six acres and haven't figured out your weed management, I don't know how you're, I, <laughs> I've had a number of different size farms weed it and they've all said they learned a ton of stuff from it, but it's primarily for people who are really need a good introduction to a wide range of weed control techniques and how to use those, especially in terms of work and crop flows. Well, I think, John, because you actually reached out to me a number of times while you were writing it. And um, I think it's a great encyclopedia too, a feeling like of just all the different techniques out there and kind of like the pros and the cons, as well as you've got some fabulous charts in there as well. So I think it's just one of those resources I think every farmer should have on their shelf to just be able to pull out when they're, they're thinking about this weed, how do I control it? Or, you know, what's this other strategy that I keep hearing about? Yeah. Well, and that's, and you know, that's what a lot of people have said. And one reason I wrote it is there was no good kind of good reference book about all of the major non-tillage, non-chemical based weed control methods with an honest assessment of when do they and don't they work and why might you want to make use of them? (laughs) Now you've done a number of other things in the, the regenerative agriculture space. I mean, you were the interim director of um, the farm, the consumer legal defense as well. Yeah, I was yeah interim executive director. And then for about a year or so, I served as executive director. Okay, very cool. Um, and talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, was, that was obviously your background and knowing of real food, just wanting to continue access to that or what got you into involved into that? So, you know, right about the time we got into real food was the time when the government was really cracking down on raw milk and private buying clubs, you know, so... so mm. You know, this is like probably 12 or 13 years ago where you have the footage of the government going into the um, Rossum warehouse in California with guns drawn on the kale and hippies, Uh you know, because hippies plus kale are such a dangerous thing. Exactly. (laughs) And so, you know, before we bought our farm, I founded a buying club. We've been around now for, you know, 13 years because my daughter's 13 because we started it right around, right before, right after she was born. Um, We got into real food when, you know, regulatory political environment was very, very poor towards certain parts of the movement. You know, a couple years after we started our buying club, we were actually raided by the Kentucky State Health Department. So we were served cease and desist and quarantine orders, um, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. And up until that point, there'd been about two dozen or more farms and, you know, food distribution operations who had been raided or otherwise had a row with the government and all of them had universally lost. Mm. So every single, you know, like Rossum closed, Mana Storehouse, I believe was up in Ohio, closed. Um, Athens locally grown, they just stopped carrying all the things I believe the government told them they couldn't. Mm-hmm. A bunch of different raw milk farmers just shut their doors, moved on to other things. And so we were the first group in the nation to win in that pitched battle with the regulatory authorities over choosing, you know, what we would eat and who we would get it from. And that's how, you know, so sometime after that, they asked me to become a board member for the Legal Defense Fund. And then for a couple of years, I served as interim executive director and executive director. I have just a little bit of experience of interacting with government bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, after that, you have to take a shower, correct? Yeah, well, I mean, because people always ask me, like, why, why am I not so active in that area? And on occasion, you just have to kind of take a break. Um, I'm really good friends with Congressman Thomas Massey. And the funny thing is, like, we almost never talk politics. We almost always talk homesteading and farming. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, you know, because the, the politics part, you know, dealing with the government, dealing with regulations, you, you have to like create some space or, or if you're a person of integrity and sanity, it's going to drive you to become like a Unabomber or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So who are your mentors in this whole journey and how did they be, help you become the farmer you are today? So in terms of farmer mentors, you know, I have a neighbor, Adam Barr, who I've known for many years before we mm-hmm. even started farming. He's like 20 minutes from us. So I have a couple more local farmers who I've just learned a great deal from going out and helping on their farms. 
Marksberry Farm, you know, which has now became like Marksberry Farm Market. In the early days of the buying club, I used to drive down on a Friday morning, like four in the morning, help them butcher two to 300 whole chickens for the buying club, load them into the back of a truck, layered and layered with ice and other stuff to keep them cold, Mm -hmm. drive back to Louisville to distribute them. Um, So I learned a great deal from Preston and his farming operation. And then obviously book wise, I've read, you know, Elliot Coleman and I'm friends with Joel Salatin. I've read all of Joel's books. Mm -hmm. Uh, My oldest daughter is like getting into reading all of my collection of Joel and Elliot, which is great to see. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, so it's been a mixture of like local farmers and then also getting to travel and see different farming operations and see, you know, what they're doing and how they're doing it, you know, given the constraints of land and location and other factors every farm has to deal with. Absolutely. So let's move into today's topic, which is weeds. Um, You know, probably one of the most frustrating things about farming for many farmers. Yeah, (laughs) that's why, you know, I I say weed is the original four-letter word. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's a good one. Tell me about your journey with weeds. Why did you write the book? I wrote the book for three reasons. One is, you know, about three or four years ago, it was a little bit or probably a month or two before this month of the year, you know, so probably like late June, early July. And um, we had had a good growing season overall, but, but we were basically like almost every single day having to be outside weeding. Mm -hmm. And it was just like a gigantic time suck, you know, like going out and pulling a few weeds as you walk through the harvest, that's kind of enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But when you have to go out and you're spending like more time weeding, you know, especially in the heat of the year when weeding is at its worst, then, you know, doing things that are actually productive, it quickly becomes a demoralizing problem. Mm -hmm. And I knew a lot of other farmers who were in similar situations where, you know, if they missed a round of cultivation or if they didn't do this or didn't do that, they would just find themselves, you know, being overran and wasting huge amounts of time, you know, often for relatively low economic value gain, trying to get, you know, weeds back under control. So kind of like with the issues we face with soil on our farm, I just began to read voraciously on different strategies and tactics for weed control. And I began to experiment with all different sorts of approaches to dealing with and managing weeds, especially approaches that work with rather than against, you know, building healthy soil, you know, because, because that's the problem with like, you know, constant tillage or constant chemical usage yeah, you can keep the weeds at bay, but you do it at the long-term cost of your soil's health. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to find weed control methods that worked with rather than against, you know, good soil stewardship principles. And so I tried every type of biomulch, you know, that you could imagine and, you know, tried all, just all these different techniques. And then I combed through all the literature and also became friends with a number of, of researchers across the country. So, you know, the people at the University of Maine, um, mm-hmm. Steve at the University of Kentucky, who's a cover crop specialist. Mm-hmm. Basically, after about two years, we cut the amount of time we spend weeding by 90%. And, and it's just amazing. Like, you know, you're talking three digits of hours over the course of a growing season saved. Yes, exactly. So basically, this is a combination of you trying to heal your soil as well as keep it weed free. And that's kind of what led you down this rabbit hole of trying to eliminate weeds and, uh, and then all that research. Yeah. And, and not so much eliminate because, you know, some of the tactics I talk about in the book involve like understanding which kind of weeds are tolerable or mm-hmm. even rarely desirable in a growing space. Um, mm-hmm. It's like early season for us, especially because the last few winters have either been late and very cold or they've been horrifically wet. You know, like there's some weeds that we'll actually let go because we can use them as edible or sellable crops or part Mm. like mixes. And then 
you know, once you get the change from those cooler fall season crops where they're finally a threat to go to seed on you, then we'll finally get rid of them before they have a chance to seed, um, you know, using one of a number of tactics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right there, you said don't let weeds go to seed because that was the same thing my mentors always told me. And, you know, they had that rule, never let a weed go to seed. Talk to us about how many seeds just a single pigweed can have. Oh, too many. It's like, I've, you know, the amaranth family, I think a single plant can drop like thousands of seed. Yeah, I think it's like 40,000 seeds. Yeah. And, and, you know, then in grasses, you know, it's the same way, like certain grasses can just drop more seed than is imaginable. Mm -hmm. The nice thing is certain techniques like solarization, if you have a better area that goes to seed on you, you know, because somebody got sick or somebody has a baby or just something goes horribly wrong. Thankfully, you know, if you do the technique right, you can kill off 99.9% of those seeds. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's better to not let it go to seed. But it's good to realize not all hope is lost Mm -hmm. as long as you don't do something dumb when it goes to seed. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but when I see the seed rain happen is we try not to till that right away because yes. the only thing you're going to do is till the seeds actually into the soil. So we try to leave them on top, let the birds, let the mice, let everything deal with it, the weather hit it, and then solarize if we can because that will cook out those seeds as best. Yeah, and that's what I tell people. It's just like, you know, um, if you have a bed that goes to seed, you know, one thing we'll sometimes do is we have a couple hand sifts. And we'll go along and we'll, re- we'll remove all of the super easy to remove seed heads. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you can do it in just a couple minutes. You run along the bed, you know, with a five-gallon bucket over your arm and a sith in the other. And you grab a bunch of stems and you cut them, you put them in the bucket. And you can knock out, you know, 80, 85% of the seeds real quick. Mm-hmm. And then we'll, you know, we'll carefully mow the bed with the mower not shooting debris anywhere, we'll close up the mower. Um, we have a you know mower we use just specifically in garden spaces uh-huh. so that it's not like contaminated with seed from everywhere. And you know we'll mow it down and if it needs water, we'll water and then we'll solarize it uh-huh. to get rid of the remaining, basically to try and get that down to like 0.05% viable seed if we can. Uh-huh. And the nice thing is since you're not tilling it, you know, you do leave all of that root matter in the ground. So you're not going to have an erosion problem. You're keeping the soil intact while still getting rid of the, the future problem that bed could create. Yeah, absolutely. I, one thing I would say is that weed control is more of a mindset than specific actions. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, with dealing with weeds, it, it's all about mentally. A lot of farmers are really big on what they're going to grow. And, you know, a lot of good farmers are really big on how they're going to grow it. But where a lot of them fail in terms of like their mental planning is then how do weeds fit into this overarching picture of your production method? And that's where for me, the mindset comes in where like, we need to plan this entire cycle, not just with our crops in mind, but with the weeds that are going to become a problem for the crops in mind. And how does our weed control play into our production model, you know, play Mm -hmm. to our crop choices and other factors. So, you know, usually my experience dealing with weeds is an afterthought for a lot Mm -hmm. of things, rather than being woven right into how they develop their, their systems and their approaches. Yeah. Because like, let's say you're dealing with something like chickweed, that's usually a, a problem in the late fall and it will overwinter and be a problem in the early spring. So if that's an issue, you probably don't want to try to have crop in the ground in the late fall and the early spring. So you can focus on eliminating the weeds at that point. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, you know, can you do a crop? Can you use something like a germination tarp Mm -hmm. to get the chickweed to germinate before the carrots do, and then go through and flame the chickweed off? Mm -hmm. So that then you have a nice early spring carrot bed that's relatively chickweed free. 
Yeah, actually, another thing we've been doing is we've actually been using landscape fabric in our winter greenhouses to even to the point of transplanting our spinach through the landscape fabric. And people were laughing at us and saying, you know, this is a, a waste of, of energy. And I'm like, actually, it took me an hour to transplant that spinach in there. And it would take me five to 10 hours all winter long to weed that spinach. So this actually saves me a heck of a lot of time. Oh, yeah. And again, it's hard to sometimes get people to realize. It's like, you know, people see us often in the spring we'll spread, you know, 10, 15, 20 tons of wood chips uh-huh. for, you know, particular crops we're growing. And people are just like, oh, that's so much time. That's so much energy. And I was like, but you do realize once I plant my potatoes and sweet potatoes, I might spend one hour the entire rest of the season having to weed them, <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. you know, and I get better yields because, and I get better soil over time. So, so yeah, like it's an upfront investment, but I derive so, and I'd rather be working in the cool of April and May uh-huh. than out there fighting weeds in June and July. You know, I'm just like, it, it's an upfront investment that pays so many dividends Once you finally get that through your head, you know, you really realize, oh man, this like does make a great deal of sense. So what you're saying is doing the right weed control is all about playing the long game. Yes. Oh, definitely. You you know, and again, sometimes you're going to have to take a loss or you're going to have to take a bet out of production or something, you know, to play the long game rather than constantly fighting, losing short-term battles. Uh Absolutely. So let's discuss some of the the bigger principles behind weed control. Cultivation versus tillage. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, you know, so for me personally, my weed control principles, you know, mimic my soil principles. You know, basically soil doesn't like to be tilled. And Uh weed control perspective all you do when you till is turn up the dead. You know, you're just replenishing your adversary from, you know, on top of, you know, exposing your soil to all kinds of other problems. Um, and that's the same, you know, with like herbicides and stuff. It basically lets you cover up temporarily like antibiotics, a deeper problem. You, you know, so when I talk about doing weed control, you know, a lot of it is, as you said, like, we don't want to let stuff go to seed. We want to engage in techniques and tactics that let us draw down the soil seed bank. And and then we want to try and avoid doing things that replenish the soil seed bank. You know, stuff like bringing in compost that's heavily laden with weed seeds. That's how we actually ended up. When we started on our farm, we had less than 0.5% organic matter. Mm. And so I got some loads of... um, cow manure from the local stockyards that's right up the road from us. The guy, you know, it was like 15 tons of cow manure delivered for $20, <laughs> you know, because they just, they just needed to get rid of it. The cows come to the stockyards to be auctioned in a couple days. So they sit there pooping all over the place, you know, so they're constantly just scraping it out, piling it up, letting it compost down. And I didn't have like, didn't have a lot of thistle, didn't have a lot of pigweed at first, You know, it was basically just old dead grass where we put in our main growing space. And I got those loads of compost in and man, like thistle and pigweed and all kinds of other, you know, and um, we call them like the the prickly cucumber plant, Mm -hmm. another one that's just a pain in the butt. And they just went nuts. And I'm like, what the heck? And then, you know, a few years later, I finally went and visited the stockyard and I saw where they were storing the compost they were making. And it was just surrounded on all sides by weeds, like six feet tall. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, I was creating my own problem. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, in in terms of the principles, you want to draw down the soil seed bank and, and not let stuff reproduce. And at the same time, not import weed seeds as much as possible. You know, so one of the things I talk about in the book is a, a lot of farmers want to grow, you know, they want to grow their annuals right up to the edge of grass or pasture. And you're just like always going to be creating problems by not having like transition spaces. And, you know, basically I call them wind weed breaks. Uh-huh. You know, the west side of our garden is a couple rows thick of comfrey and then blackberries because 
that provides a transition from our lawn to our annual growing space that gives us an area that's still, you know, productive because that comfrey attracts pollinators, it attracts predator species. So, you know, it plays a good part in integrated pest management. Berries are obviously a high value crop. Um, but it serves as like this nice windbreak and transition zone so that the predominant winds we get from west to east, when it blows stuff from the adjoining grass and pasture, it can't make it all the way into our growing space easily. Mm-hmm. And we've seen it makes just a substantial difference, you know, putting that 10 to 15 feet wide strip into that kind of purpose. Um, and it mm-hmm. also helps too when we have storms come through because, you know, the blackberries and the comfrey take the brunt of the beating. And then even farther out, I've started to establish an elderberry orchard. I uh, shouldn't say orchard, you know, like cultivated elderberry space. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, so, it, so design, you know, stepping back from like your individual beds and rows and thinking about how you've designed this entire growing space uh, can really make a difference in your long-term, you know, effort and, and, you know, how much, how much you have to exert to keep weeds at bay and under control. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So John, there's some organic herbicides out there now. Um, Have you had experience with them and what are your thoughts on using those? Organic herbicides, some of them in some field trials show significant promise against some species of weeds. Uh, you, you know, so, so that's a whole bunch of sums. AKA <laughs> yes. Ifs. And, you know, the other thing when I looked into them and the ones I've used, um, they are expensive on a per acre basis. Mm, gotcha. So significantly more expensive than almost any other method of weed control on a per acre basis. So that's not to say that you might not have a particular species and a particular crop that makes that additional expense pencil out. But, you know, for the most part, I, after having talked with so many different people, having used a few of them myself, and then having crunched the numbers on how much they cost, I don't see it as being economically viable. Mm -hmm operations to go this route, uh, you know, of these organic herbicides. Yeah, it might be good for spot spraying different sections that are maybe tough to get in mechanically. Yeah, well, well, but you know, that's where though, it's just like, if an area, it obviously depends on the the size of the area, but they now have handheld steam weeders. Oh, really? Yeah, now there's, you know, there's one on Amazon that's only like 140 bucks. And so I've been wanting to get one just to see how it does, you know, because if you have a really small spot, you know, and that's the thing, like you can get a solarization tarp, you can get it anywhere, you know, you Uh can down or fold down a plastic tarp to whatever size you need. Um, And, you know, this is why in my book, the one thing I talk about is like with fences, fences are one of, you know, often become a real problem if you need fences to keep deer Uh or you know, problematic pests out of your gardens, you know, how do you fence without then creating, you know, weed central Mm -hmm. in and around and under the fence, you know, because you can't mow under a fence and you can't really weed whack a fence because modern weed whackers are so powerful. They just beat the daylights out of, you know, most fencing wire, Mm -hmm. you know, around a fence is one of the few places, you know, flaming or steaming, or an organic herbicide, you know, becomes one of your few, few usable approaches, unless you've, you know, done something under the fence to ensure nothing grows. Mm, Absolutely. With that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with John Moody and talking about his book, Winning the War on Weeds. Hey, Michael here. I hope you are enjoying this episode so far. 
If you are looking to shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources. There we have a resource bundle, which contains a bunch of different eBooks that we put together over the years on everything from winter growing to wash and shed efficiency, to pastured poultry processes, to building your farm and buying the right property. One of the resources I want to highlight is our Profitable Farmers Toolkit. Now, this is something that's been downloaded by over 3,000 farmers. It's a free resource. It contains tips for setting up your farm, financial systems and apps that you can use to track your farm, our favorite tools for the greenhouse, field and wash and shed, innovative apps for farming and how to put automated systems in place to make your farm run more efficiently. So if you haven't already, pop on over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download it today. All right, so I am back here with John Moody, and we are talking about his new book, Winning the War on Weeds. John, so let's talk about the tough weeds, which I hear about all the time, the rhizome weeds, such as Bermuda, quackgrass, nutsedge. What strategies do you recommend for them? Yeah, so if if you have well-established rhizome reproducers, while it's no fun, usually the best strategy is to take that area out of production and overwinter oculate it to weaken them, Mm -hmm. then in the summer, um, you know, solarize. And then usually you will be able to do a late summer, early fall planting. And and that generally will get it completely under control. Mm -hmm. So you're basically pulling it out of production for almost a year just to really get those, those, the breakdown. Yeah. If they're, and I'm talking like, if you have a really bad problem, yeah, I mean, another thing would be to cultivate it out, but then that's damaging your soil structure. Cultivation, and it depends on how deep the rhizome reproducers are running, because the difference between cultivation and tillage is one of depth. Yeah. You know, so, so cultivation, usually you are seeking to disturb nothing but the top inch or less of soil. Mm-hmm. And in my experience, and in you know, talking with some other weed specialists, there's just some rhizome reproducers that cultivation generally won't actually help with. You know, th- they'll cut off all the tops, mm-hmm. but the, you're not going deep enough into the soil to attack, you know, the juicy, meaty root stores of the plant. Gotcha. So that's going more deeper with like a seed tine and tilling and the kind of like really deeply pulling those, those rhizomes out. Yeah, but as you know, like when you till, you cut, and when you cut up rhizomes, you can just as easily as get rid of the weeds as cause them to proliferate. Yeah. And so cultivation and tillage for controlling certain rhizomes, you know, is is dicey business in my opinion. Um, Gotcha. The goal is to try and keep them out of your spaces in the first place. And, you know, the one thing I say when I give my soil talk and my weed talk is, there are some situations where tillage may make sense. If you have soil that needs a fair bit of organic matter incorporated, if you can till one time and incorporate amendments, incorporate organic matter, you know, fix some structural issues in the soil while dealing with weed pressure, and then, you know, immediately, um, you know, maybe cover crop it. Mm-hmm then mow that cover crop and then oculate it down to kind of finish things. You you know, there's some workflows I talk about in the book, I believe. And, you know, I've talked about in some of my talks, like there are times kind of like antibiotics, the tillage really might be the best thing for your soil, Mm -hmm. you know, or particular section of soil or whatever. Generally, no, we want to avoid tillage because I don't think it's going to help with our weed problems. But there are times where I've said to someone, no, like this is probably based on your soil test results. Weed species you're dealing with plan really, really well, but Mm -hmm. go ahead and till and till well until responsibly immediately get it into a cover crop, follow this workflow. And not only you're going to deal with the weed problem, but you're actually going to substantially improve your soil at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So mulches, um, you mentioned that in the book and a, a lot of different types of mulches here. You got the, you know, the bioplastics, you got landscape fabric, you've also got organic mulches, straw, um, wood chips. Uh, give us a little bit of an overview of, of your opinion of mulching. So we use mulches heavily, um, especially for crops that, 
you know, are compatible with mulches. And, you know, numerous studies show that mulches just like have so many benefits to the crops, to your crop yields, um, because mulches do things like reduce soil temperature, especially. Mm -hmm. So if you're a farther south farmer, you know, mulches allow plants to yield better because it reduces stress a few inches of the soil and it reduces evaporation. So a couple years ago, we had a really bad drought in the summer. We've had a really bad drought this summer too, unfortunately, after a crazy wet spring. And we generally use 75 to 80% less irrigation than you know, our neighbors and what would actually be needed to what we grow through a drought because of the mulches mm-hmm. and their water sparing effect. And so, you know, like if you deal with hot, dry weather, um, bio mulches especially make such a substantial difference in terms of, you know, your need to run and use irrigation and to your yields because of the reduction in plant stress. Mm. I'm a big fan of, you know, bio mulches if you can safely get your hands on them. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some people actually mulch with compost. Yes, yeah. And actually, we have a couple good episodes. So Ray Tyler is season two, episode seven. And then Josh Satin is season two, episode 11. Both of have significant different mulching strategies. Um, so if you want more info on that, you can go listen to those episodes. Yeah. And, and they're usually using compost mulch specifically for like carrots, lettuces, other high value, finer mm-hmm. crops. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So they're being able to put that right on. And herbicide contamination, though, with the organic mulches, that is something we have to be aware of, correct? Oh, yeah. And this applies including to compost. Um, But, you you know, the greatest risk with mulches, and this now even to some extent applies to tree-based mulches, Uh is the risk of bringing, you know, next generation herbicides, you know, onto your land and into your soil. Um, sh- you know, straw and hay. I don't recommend hay as a mulch. So the, the Roost Stout fans can hate me. <laughs> but, but, you know, in my book, I call it the hay treadmill. Yes. Um, it's just like the hamster wheel of hay. So just who, who in their right mind wants to put a substance down on their growing space that contains more weed seeds than like all the children of Moses. Uh-huh. And hay also has the risk of herbicides, um, straw, it is, you know, the more major herbicide risk, as is, you know, animal-based compost. But muni- municipal compost as well has been a substantial problem, parts of Europe and across certain parts of America. You know, because with municipal compost, you'll have somebody who had their lawn treated, and the lawn treatment company, you know, uses amino prylid or clot prylid or something. And then, you know, the lawn treatment company does the treatment. Then their lawn mower people come along and mow the lawn and bag up the clippings. And then the municipal compost people come along and grab those bags of clippings. And even though it's only one lawn, those clippings get mixed into you know, 500 cubic yard of compost. And now you have 500 cubic yards of contaminated compost. Yeah. And because those things are sensitive at millions, I mean, one, like one in a million parts, it's amazing how sensitive the seeds are to those chemicals. Oh yeah. 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 Amino prylid. I don't know if I put it in my book. I don't remember. I think it was something like, you know, at one part per billion. Oh really? Wow. Five parts per billion. It's just, when you look at the numbers, you're just like, oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what we've done here actually is we'll get leaves in the fall from our municipality and we compost them ourselves, but yep. we're very careful to wait till about halfway through the leaf season so that all the lawns have been mowed and all those grass clippings are ahead of us before we start getting the leaves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's where, you know, like anytime we bring, you know, wood chips, they're still the lowest risk bio mulch. Um, I think it was the university, uh, you know, the Polyup Extension Center out of Oregon University. They're also, in in terms of all the field trials I've seen, the absolute best biomulch for crops you can use wood chips with. 
All right, so let's let's stop and talk about that for a second because I know a lot of people say, oh, if I put wood chips down, I'm going to get the nitrogen tie up. And, you know, we actually had that in our farm where we had some wood chips and I tilled and the crop just sat there. What are people doing wrong that are having that issue? Yeah, you never till wood chips into the soil. <laughs> hmm Yep, that's what it was. Yeah, and, and so like the nitrogen tie up wood chips create, if you do it right, only occurs in the top quarter inch or so of the soil. Okay. And, and, and this is one reason why wood chips are such a great weed suppressor because they only deny nitrogen to the weeds that are right in the very top edge of the soil. And, you know, normally with wood chips, you're either planting a little bit deeper, but most of the time you're transplanting. The stuff you're putting into a wood chip mulch is generally far, far below where any you know, nitrogen issues should take place unless you do the crazy thing of tilling the wood chips into the soil. And if you build chips into the soil, then you just need to go buy a couple gallons of blood meal (laughs) and you're going to need to spray it, you know, over the areas you applied the wood, you know, and it's, you know, my general recommendation is if you did something crazy and you tilled a bunch of wood chips or sawdust or other really high carbon, you know, stuff into your soil, do a soil test first, or if you haven't, because you, you don't want to, you know, create a nutrient issue on top of creating a nitrogen issue. Depending on what your soil test says, you know, get some blood meal, maybe add to it some molasses, add to it some effective microorganisms, especially some strains that are fungal in nature, because bacteria can't eat wood chips and stuff. Mm-hmm. A few species of bacteria can break down wood chips, but they usually have to wait for fungi and other things to break them down first. Gotcha. And so hit the space, you know, with that mixture of nitrogen, molasses to feed microbes and fungi, and then effective microorganisms diluted down in water. And you'll end up with some absolutely amazing soil, you know, but, um, <laughs> you know, it'll take a while. Well, it won't, it actually, you know, it doesn't take that long. If you do, you know, like three sprayings spread out over, you know, every three to four weeks, I've even seen people successfully grow through it, you you know, just by, but, you know, as you said, if you don't spray, stuff just sits there kind of in Mm -hmm. a giant stasis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. You know, so wood chips are absolutely great. You just never till them into the soil. But the other drawback to wood chips is they're really incompatible with a lot of crop choices and some tool systems. Um, you know, you, you can't run a cedar through wood chips. Correct. Yeah. You can't run a paper pot through heavily wood chipped beds. At least I've never seen anyone successfully do it. Maybe some people have figured that out. Or, you know, you could probably do it with like ramiel chipped wood or something. Yeah. But- you're not going to pull it off with. Yeah. So, so I love wood chips. So great for like squashes, sweet potatoes, potatoes, you know, crops that are going to be there a while and yield for a while or, or beds that you're going to rotate through crops like that mm-hmm. can transplant in. Um, and I really like marrying wood chips then to like a cover, you know, an understory cover crop of clovers Okay, because that's giving nitrogen. Oh, oh yeah. Well, but it, you know, it's um, it, it attracts pollinators. It creates habitat for predator species. So a lot of crops we trellis, like peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes. We don't do a lot of tomatoes, uh, but when we do tomatoes, you know, these are all crops we're growing up. We wood chip them in, um, you know, either at transplant or once they're kind of big enough to take three, four inches of wood chip mulch. And then I will often sow a clover understory under these plants mm. because then you get a measure, you know, you're, you're growing your fertilizer for the next crop at the same time as further suppressing weeds, at the same time as further improving your soil, and at the same time as improving your yields because, again, the clovers are attracting pollinators, the clovers are further, you know, allowing air water to penetrate the soil you know so they're supporting the soil food web they're keeping the soil even cooler underneath the plants 
you know, I love Steve's work out of the University of Kentucky, showing just how hard you can push cover crops and understories of cover crops and stuff with profitable plants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because a lot of growers would just never think to not only do like a bio mulch underneath a planting, but then to do a cover crop with the bio mulch underneath mm -hmm. them. Gotcha. But, but they work beautifully once you kind of sort out your timing. Yes. Yep, absolutely. So, John, if you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Oh, goodness. My favorite farming tool is children. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Many hands make light work. Exactly. Well, because, you know, a lot of our actual sellable crops done by our kids. So my son, Caleb, generally sells multiple thousand dollars of produce a year. And that's how he pays for his judo and a lot of other things he wants to do. Um, and he's really successful. So he's really excited about the weed control stuff because, you know, a couple weeks ago, he was out there turning over beds and solarizing them while the solarizing was good to get ready for his next set of profitable crops. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then your daughter is into the elderberries. Yeah, Abby does elderberries with me. She also did flowers this year. Um, and that's what I like about these techniques is like, we oculated her flower bed area and we mulched it. And then she did, you know, zinnias. And it was amazing how effective it was for flower production. So um, John, where can people find out more about you and your work? So you can go to my website. It's johnwmoody.com. Okay. Um, I'm also on Facebook, so you can friend me on Facebook. So either of those, or if you're going to be at, you know, one of the Mother Earth news fairs, I speak at a lot of different conferences across the country. So it's always good to get to connect with people in person. Very cool. And we'll obviously have a lot of the things that you mentioned in the show notes and a link to your book as well in the show notes. So it'll be the Thriving Farmer podcast backslash John Moody will be the, the URL for that. So go check that out as well. John, thank you so much for your time here today. Really appreciate it. And I know we're gonna get a lot out of the book. Great, well, thanks, friend. Thank you so much for having me and you have a great day. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please 